So now let's think about this, one frequency in, one frequency out. And this property actually has a profound implication. And the implication is what we call bandwidth conservation. That the bandwidth of a signal at the input limits the bandwidth at the output also. So in other words, uh, no new frequencies can be um, created. And we can see this uh, right away from this simple representation. So before I said that h of f was the uh, ratio of output to input, another way to put it is that the output is the product of the uh, frequency response times the input signal um, spectrum, uh, or excuse me, um, Fourier transform. So in this case, that means if x of f is zero for a certain frequency, x of f has no content at a certain frequency. So if that is zero, then it doesn't really matter what my system does. Uh, it's going to be multiplied by zero, so the output's going to be zero. So that means that uh, no new frequencies can be created. The only frequencies I can have at the output were frequencies which were already present at the input. That means if I have a band-limited input, I have an input which is limited to certain frequencies and zero for other frequencies, that the output will also be band-limited. So we've seen the definition of a filter, we've seen the definition of a linear time invariant system, and now I'm going to talk about ideal filters. And in particular, I'm going to talk about how uh, ideal filters are, are interesting because we use them to describe systems, but of course they're idealized and not necessarily practical. So I'll also talk a little bit about you know, how we take the step of going from our ideal filters to realizing something that at least is close in some, some degree to an ideal filter. So these ideas about ideal uh, linear systems and filters is covered in section 1.6 of our textbook from Sklar. I'm going to start with the defi definition of a causal system or causality. By definition, a causal system is one that at a specific time, the output is a function of the input at that instant of time or previously, but never a function of what comes after. So this definition of a causal system is just like common sense. It's a system that cannot predict the future. So when I have an input, the output, well, it could be responding to something that was input previously, but it cannot know ahead of time that the next little bit that's coming on my input signal is a huge impulse. It just doesn't know that, can't predict the future. Uh, so causal systems are realistic systems. All realistic systems, all systems that I can create in the laboratory are causal systems. They cannot predict the future. So a couple simple examples of a causal system is of course our ideal amplifier. It's a causal system. And even if I had a signal which is an integrator so that I look at the input up to a certain time and I integrate that, that that's also a causal system. So I, I'm keeping, I'm, I'm sort of uh, smooth, um, averaging out, if you will, I'm, I'm integrating over the signal uh, up to the current time. That's cool, that's causal. Let's look at a counterexample. Counterexample would be a smoothing filter. A smoothing filter says, I wanna know, I wanna get rid of a lot of variations maybe. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the input and I'm gonna integrate it, but not from minus infinity to the current time. I'm gonna look at a box around the current time and look at what it is before and after and sort of smooth it out. Of course, that doesn't work because I need to know what's happening after this instant of time. And that would be a system which is not causal. Now I'll talk about how I can do an approximation of this. That's not hard. Uh, but just definition, it is not a causal system. So I said I was going to give you some ideal filters. So the first ideal filter is what we call an ideal transmission line. And that means that uh, whatever I send in my system comes out completely undistorted. The only thing they might do it might be amplified. Maybe the amplitude's changed a little bit. And maybe it's delayed, might be delayed a bit, but it's not distorted. No change in phase, no distortion. Uh, so the frequency response for such a system, very easy to find. I take the uh, Fourier transform of both sides and I take the ratio and of course the only thing that happens is this delay and the Fourier transform of the delay is an exp complex exponential and uh, of course the um, uh, change in, in, in amplitude, the gain. So the frequency response for this ideal transmission line is k times the uh, exponential of minus j 2 pi f times t0. So it's a function of what particular delay there is here. So if I take this um, complex 
uh, frequency response, and I look at the module. The module would be just k, because of course a complex exponential has module of 1. And if I look at the phase, uh, which I write as the argument, uh, but could be written as the phase of h of f, is equal to, uh, of course it's just the um, exponent in the complex exponent, it's 2 pi f uh, t0. And uh, I often call that 2 pi t0 as being 1 over f0, um, 2 pi over f0, so uh, I get uh, another way of writing it is f divided by f0. A second ideal filter that we often see in communication systems is the ideal low-pass filter. This filter, by definition, is a rectangle. So I define it in the frequency domain. It's a rectangle in the frequency domain. And it's centered on DC. It's centered at the frequency 0. And it uh, has um, a maximum frequency. So I call that the upper frequency, FU. So between minus FU and FU, this function is equal to 1. And everywhere else, this function is equal to 0. So an easy way to write this is a rectangle f divided by 2fu. 2fu represents the width of the rectangle, and the rectangle function is by definition centered at the origin. So the idea, well, the reason we call this a low pass filter is if we look in the frequency domain, it is just the low frequencies which pass completely unaltered, and all of the high frequencies, anything above the upper frequency, is completely cut off. So it's called ideal because there is, uh, it's just equal to 1, uh, and, uh, and there is this sort of infinite slope here. Uh, this is what makes it ideal. So the concept is simple. I cut off everything outside of a certain frequency range, and that range inside is completely unaffected. So the ideal low-pass filter, we've seen the definition of the frequency response, which is a rectangle. And of course, if I want to, I can look for the inverse Fourier transform of the frequency response, which will give me the impulse response. And I know that the inverse Fourier transform of a perfect rectangle is a uh, sinc function. So here is the sinc function. Um, so this is what the impulse response uh, would look like. Another ideal filter that we see often in communications is called the ideal band pass filter. And so this is a filter which is again uh, defined uh, with rectangles. Uh, in this case, the rectangle is at, centered at some uh, higher frequency and it has a certain width to it. And so we will define this uh, rectangle as being from some lower frequency to some upper frequency. And of course, it's entirely symmetric, so it's also, uh, for the negative frequencies, it also has uh, the same uh, shape. Um, again, ideal because of the uh, infinite slope here. It's completely uh, unchanges, no change at all to any content within the pass band of the band pass filter, and everything else is set uh, completely to zero. So I've talked so far about the ideal versions of the filters that we'll be discussing in our digital communications class, which we'll be using to manipulate our digital communication systems. Uh, but I'd also like to talk a little bit about the realistic versions of these filters, and in particular the low pass filter, and uh, look at the um, practical uh, properties of these these filters. So one very inexpensive version would be a RC low-pass filter. It's a, an RC circuit which is used to create this sort of low-pass. And uh, the frequency response of an RC filter is 1 over 1 plus j 2 pi f times tau, where tau is the time constant which is determined by the resistance and capacitance that I use in my circuit. And uh, looking at uh, this expression, we can see that as the frequencies get very high, of course, I'll be dividing by a very large number, and I'm going to be attenuating my high, high frequencies, and that the lower frequencies will see the least of this attenuation. I can also look at the impulse response for uh, this uh, version of the low-pass filter. So I take the H of F, I look for the inverse uh, Fourier transform, and I get a, a one-sided decaying exponential. So completely zero, uh, and then an uh, exponential decay. Of course, this doesn't look very much like a, a sinc function. Uh, but this would be an approximation, a simple approximation of an RC um, low-pass filter. Uh, 
So what happens if I put at the input to this um, low pass filter, I put in a, um, a rectangle. So at the input, I have something that in the time domain, this is time, is some square wave. So I put in a single square wave, push it through this system, which is a low pass filter, what happens? Well, what I get at the output, you can do the analysis. So one way to do the analysis is to um, take the convolution of the rectangle with that one-sided exponential decay, and, and you would get something that looks like this. So you would see the distortion introduced to a rectangle, for instance, uh, by this very simple low-pass filter. Suppose I want to find something that looks closer to my ideal filter than that simple RC low-pass filter. Well, there are a couple issues I have to deal with before I can do that. And the first is the causality. So we have the definition of causality already. And if we look at the impulse response, what does the impulse response have to look like in order to have a causal filter? This will help us to see how we can take our ideal filters, which are not causal, and try to make them realistic. Because I know they have to be causal if I'm going to ever have a chance of implementing them in the lab. So let's take this idea of causal, and let's look at what that means for a system to look at the impulse response. What is the implication for the impulse response in order for me to have a causal uh, system? Well, if I look at the output at any given time, I know that as a function of the impulse response, it's determined by this convolution integral. So I give my definition of the convolution integral here. And of course, the convolution integral goes from minus infinity to infinity. Now, if I want the output to only be a function of x, the input, up until time t, that means that this integral from minus infinity to infinity has got to be minus infinity to t. Because if this was not true, if these two uh, um, expressions were not true, then I would not have a causal system because the output at a function of time would also be a function of what happens after t. So uh, how am I going to force that uh, these two are equal? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a um, criteria on h to force that this equality will happen between the two integrals. I'm going to force that the h of t is going to be 0 from t to infinity. So how uh, can I put in that criteria? So causality, in order to have causality, what I want is to uh, limit the expression for this, um, the, the integration bounds for this um, integral. So what I want to do is I want to have that minus infinity to infinity to become a minus infinity to t, and I want to base it, I want to push it onto the part of the integral which is h of t minus u. So what I said I wanted to do was that I wanted to force that h of t minus u is equal to zero for uh, t, or I guess I should say, sorry, for u between t and infinity. Because if this function is 0, then this is true. Because from t to infinity, I'm going to be multiplying by 0. So saying that, um, that h of t minus u is 0 for uh, u between uh, t and infinity, what's that the equivalent of? Well, let me put it here. It's the same as saying that um, 0 less than u minus t less than infinity. Infinity minus t is also infinity. Now this is almost the same, but I want t minus u, so it's going to be 0 greater than t minus u greater than minus infinity. So that means that this function, let's think of it as h of z, has got to be equal to 0 for all z between 0 and minus infinity. So that means that this function uh, this impulse response has got to be equal to zero for all z less than zero. So I've left here this criteria in order to have a causal system. What is a causal system? It's a, a system whose impulse response is zero for all uh, negative values of the argument.
So let's go back to the two impulse responses we've seen for our two versions of low-pass filters. We have the causal version. I'm telling you now it's causal. It's the RC low-pass filter because that was a one-sided decaying exponential. It's one-sided, which means it respects this property for causality. So yes, this is a causal system. Now let's look at the sync function, which was for the ideal low-pass filter. In the time domain, we had h of t is equal to this sync function. So this is clearly a non-causal system because we did not respect this idea of being zero for uh, before the origin. So if I need to make a practical version of the ideal filter, which is um, still uh, creatable, realizable in the laboratory, I have to make it causal. So what, what do I need to do to make my filter causal? First thing, first step, is I have to truncate it. It can't go on to minus infinity. So at some point I have to truncate it. Here I've looked at, and right when the first, uh, um, the, the second uh, uh, side lobe starts, I'm going to truncate it. Um, I have to truncate it somewhere. I'm forcing it to be zero before that time. So I'm, I'm of course, where I truncate it, if I truncate it far enough along, the side lobes will have gotten quite small, and maybe it won't have such a big effect. But okay, I truncated somewhere. That's step one. Step two is to introduce a delay. Because here it's true, it's zero for many negative values of t, but it's not zero for all negative values of t. So how am I going to change that? Well, I've got to introduce a delay. So I introduce a delay so that wherever I truncate it now becomes the new uh, t0 by introducing this delay of, of tau. And so now I have a causal system. And the distortion, how close is my approximation going to be to the ideal version? It depends on where I truncate it. So the farther I truncate it, the closer the approximation will be to an ideal filter. But of course, the longer I tr let it go before truncating, that means I'm going to introduce a bigger delay. So if in my system it's very important to have low latency, to not wait for my digital signal to be available to me, of course then I don't want to make the delay too big. So it's really a, um, a trade-off in any real system. But the important lesson is that we can always make a filter causal by truncating it and introducing a delay. And if I want to put those words into an equation, I would say the equivalent is here. Here's the delay. I take my filter, which is not causal, and I introduce a delay. And then the u of t, u of t is a step function, the unit step function. So u of t is equal to 1 for t positive is equal to 0 for t negative. And uh, therefore, this is the truncation. So here, truncate is going on here. And of course, delay is going here. So if I truncate and delay, that means the causal version is going to be written in this fashion. So I take the non-causal version, multiply it by a unit step function, but I delay it first.